Peggy's Spaghetti Works by Peggy Thompson. Pictures by Gloria Kamen. It's a great day for spaghetti. At the Spaghetti Works, the floor is shaking. Spaghetti is already rattling down the chutes, and Siggy has flour in his eyebrows, on his elbows, and across his shoes. He calls hi to the kids at his doorstop. Welcome! They've come to see him make spaghetti and pack it into boxes. He will show them from start to finish. He'll show what to do if it's their turn to make tons of it. Tons of macaroni too, noodles, seashells, little bow ties. And lasagna, says Siggy. I almost forgot lasagna. Flour comes first, says Siggy. It's the big ingredient, and spaghetti makers need lots. But the great thing is that all they is that's all they need. Flour plus some water for mixing it is the recipe for spaghetti. The tricky part is to get a good mix. Too much water with the flour and splodge. The mix is a mess. Too little and it's a rock, Siggy says. The mix has to stretch. So when it's pressed through holes in the machine, out come just what you want. Spaghetti springs. How much flour does it take to make a hundred tons of spaghetti? A hundred tons of flour and eight tons just for good measure. Siggy often telephones farmers to ask how are things in North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota? Is the weather good? Is the wheat fine? He's checking on the wheat with the hard gold kernels, the durum wheat that's ground into flour for spaghetti. On Monday, Siggy calls the mills. Hello, hello, help! Our supplies are running low. Please send flour. He asks for semolina, the flour that's ground from durum wheat. Semolina is gritty like sugar, and spaghetti made from it holds a good shape. It won't go to mush. When you make a hundred tons of spaghetti, Siggy says, it helps to have a factory as big as a city block. A factory like his, he means, with railroad tracks to bring the tank cars alongside and hoses to snuffle the flour up into the building. Siggy asks the mills to send three tank cars, 300 tons of flour, please. That should be just enough for now. Inside, Siggy has silos to keep the flour dry. He has four of them. Four stories high and a lot of machinery and hundreds of miles of pipes and belts and chutes and a crew of spaghetti makers in white hats. The stairs are plain and steep, but Siggy likes the climb. Two steps at a time, he leads the way up through the door into his favorite... Bright, wide open, noisy space where flour rushes through the white pipes, water through the black. This is where spaghetti gets its start, where huge machines with ladders up their sides hum and rumble, blinking their lights. Follow me, says Siggy, only this time he needs to shout. To the top, friends, to read the dials and keep watch. Now, Siggy says, now is when to check how the rotator blades cut and crumble, mixing the flour and water. Is the mix a wet mess? Is it a rock? This could be the surprise bad batch. But it's not. So the fine stretchy wad of dough down below is pressed upwards and out through the rows of the little holes. Good news, this machine is sending out great rows of spaghetti strings, long and golden white, perfect. Siggy says, the rods up above are moving like clockwork, a whole parade of them. They lift the strings and carry them along, fluttering into the dryer. The new wet spaghetti strings are fine, Siggy says. They will just hang drying in the hot dryer shed until tomorrow. And never mind the weight, he says, because yesterday's spaghetti is tumbling out. Hot from the dryer, it's dry and stiff as needles, ready for a ride down the chute. If one rod goes off the track, they might all go, and you can call in a backhoe to clean up the mess. Siggy's tip. When dry little U-shapes get snipped off from where the spaghetti hangs over rods, grind them back up into flour. Sweep up U's on the floor to sell for pig food. No running is a good rule, says Siggy, but the spaghetti gets to travel fast. It slides down the chutes from floor to floor, and it rides around on conveyor belts. Bundles of it get weighed and stuffed into skinny boxes with windows. If the boxes pop, more pig food. Danger! Look out! Dry spaghetti on the floor is slick. It rolls your feet out from under you. Some old-time spaghetti machines ran on horsepower. One horse, or on people power, to mix the flour and water. Siggy says, there's a help and rescue call from the kitchen. Tasters, please check the dry spaghetti for quality. Is it tip top? Tasters, please taste the cooked spaghetti with care. Does it go to mush or does it stay nicely firm and springy to the teeth? Siggy says to watch the boxes. They're on the move, going into cartons. The 
cartons are going on to skids, and forklifts will deliver them to trucks at the loading dock. Ziggy says other boxes at the dock have made the same trip. Some of them are filled with macaroni or noodles, or seashells, or little bow ties. Some are filled with lasagna. Some macaroni and noodles have been colored and flavored from the start with squirts from Siggy's pool of spinach and egg and tomato. One car load of flour has become 200,000 boxes of spaghetti, one pound each. Siggy says, dyes inside the machines make the different shapes. They're important. He says, dyes are the heavy metal parts with the holes in them, like shower heads for sending out streams of dough. Spaghetti makers brag about having good dyes and lots of them. Siggy says his are terrific. He knows by looking at the holes that this die is for making spaghetti and that die with the smaller holes is for making spaghetti's extra skinny sister, spaghettini. The other die with the slots is for lasagna. Dies for making spaghetti have small round holes. Dies for making macaroni have round holes with a pin in the holes to make the macaroni hollow. A rotating knife cuts the pieces short and a nick in the pin will bend the macaroni to produce elbows. Dies for making lasagna have flat slots. The slots turn up at the ends to create lasagna's roughly edges. Another spaghetti die, Siggy's favorite, has the spaghetti holes all in a row. Dies for making ABCs have ABC cutouts. The flour and water mix for noodles has eggs in it. Some noodles go through a die with slits. Others are rolled out flat and cut into strips. Bow ties can be cookie cutter work. Dozens of spaghetti cousins are made from flour and water recipes. They are great foods, too, with fine names to say out loud and fun shapes to bite into. Siggy says, please meet the special members of the pasta family. Farfal, Stellini, Linguini, Annalini, Gemellini, Alphabeto, Ziti, Fusili, Orecchiet, or, 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 Capelli, D'Angelo, Ditali, Manicotti, Ditalini, Rigatoni, Rattel, Fettuccini, Crest, Degali, vernicelli, penne, and rotini. Spaghetti gets its name from spago, a piece of string in Italian. Macaroni is Italian too. Maybe someone said macaroni, meaning ah, my dearest darlings. Noodles are from the German word noodlen. Shells, elbows, wagon wheels, and bow ties show up on shelves under their American names. And ravioli sounds good enough to eat. Lasagna may be from a Latin word for pot, boil pasta in, or from an Italian word for adult or a goof. More names from the Italian are Alphabeto, ABCs, Annalini, Little Rings, Capelli d'Angelo, Angel Hair, Crest di Galli, Coxcomb, Ditali, Thimbles, Ditalini, Little Thimbles, Farfal, Butterflies, Fettuccini, Small Ribbons, Vasili, Twists of Spaghetti, Gem Gem Gemelli, Twins, Twists of Spaghetti, Linguini, little tongues, manicotti, small muffs, orecchettes, little ears, penne, quill pens or feathers, also called mustacholi, small mustaches, rigatoni, large group macaroni, ratel, spirals, rotini, small spirals, stellini, little stars, vermicelli, little worms, and ziti, long tooth. Siggy's pasta quiz calls for sorting out his pieces into four kinds, into strings or rods. They're round and solid, such as spaghetti. Tubes, hollow, such as macaroni and zitti. Ribbons, flat, such as noodles and lasagna. Other shapes, such as butterflies or ABCs or stars. At the Spaghetti Works, Siggy sticks to dry pasta shapes. At home, he makes stuffed pasta too. He fills little pillows of ravioli with meat or cheese, and he seals them shut the way his mother showed him. Siggy calls time out for stepping fast to his spaghetti legs rack. It will shake off the flour, he says. Then he asks, who made spaghetti first? Who figured out how to make a flour paste and to shape it and dry it so it doesn't rot, and then to have it always ready for boiling up? The very first must have been the Chinese 7,000 years ago, or even more years than that. But Siggy thinks that farther on in time, just about wherever people grew eat, they fooled around and made something like spaghetti and said, it's delicious. In the 1200s, teenage Marco Polo, traveling to the court of Kublai Khan, wrote in his diary that he was eating great pasta in China. Siggy says it must have reminded young Marco of spaghetti at home in his own Italian kitchen. While Marco traveled, an Italian soldier going to war wrote in his will, I leave my bushel basket of pasta to my family, though he knew and loved spaghetti. And others in his homeland did too, at least a thousand years before that. Italian street sellers later cooked spaghetti outdoors in big pots. 
to attract crowds, they'd shout and wave hot spaghetti strands about and drop them from on high into their mouths. American hero Thomas Jefferson liked pasta so much when he visited Italy that he sent home two cases of it, plus some Parmesan cheese and a macaroni machine. When he was president, he served macaroni pie in the White House. Um, one congressman, who did not appreciate it, said the odd dish tasted very strong and was not agreeable. Only dandies ate pasta in those days, or so people who sang a teasing song about Yankee Doodle Dandy. He stuck a feather in his hat and, the big show-off, called it macaroni. Comic Charlie Chaplin showed the world how to eat spaghetti with style. He twirled it nicely. He tucked in the dangly ends neatly. He looked blissful, even though the spaghetti strings were really boiled up laces from hungry Charlie's boot. By the 1880s, workers from Italy had flocked to America and were twirling spaghetti on their forks in neighborhood restaurants. Spaghetti was a dish from their homeland, but tomatoes for the red spaghetti sauce were a food from the Americas. Figgy says, Italians learned about tomatoes from us. Figgy says, now here is how the Chinese made their noodles, and they still do, without pressing their dough through little holes, without snipping it into strips either. A Chinese cook bangs his noodle dough against the table. He stretches it, twists it, folds it, dusts it with flour, and does it all again. Then look out. When he throws it high, lots of very long strings rain down. The Chinese call them dragon's beards. Siggy says, egg in the flour and water mix is part of the secret. So is dry weather and practice. Say 5,000 years of it. Some Chinese make 4,000 8 foot long noodles in 20 minutes. Others say 512 is a number to be proud of. Siggy score zero with many, with many messes. He's still practicing. Siggy says, time flies when there's spaghetti talk. All the mop-up jobs before the bell will have to be fast. There's machinery to oil, dyes to wash, dyes to dry, labels to lick and stick, backs to pat all around for good work. And last of all, a fleet of trucks to wave off on trips to faraway cities. Goodbye spaghetti, macaroni, noodles, seashells, and bow ties. Goodbye, goodbye.